Playing victim in the 21st century is a political tool. It is both an art and a science. An art because you must genuinely feel victimized by your circumstances regardless of the objective basis of your feelings. And it is a science in the service of conveying your victim status to the rest of the world. You must have a deep understanding of and a considerable influence in the realms of academia, media and business to be able to sell your victim story. In the absence of such an understanding and influence, victimhood ceases to be an art or a science. It becomes a fact. You, a person of Indian origin, for example, are a victim of ethnocide and yet no one seems to know or care. The UNESCO Declaration of San Jose 1981 stated, quote, Ethnocide means that an ethnic group is denied the right to enjoy, develop and transmit its own culture and its own language, whether collectively or individually. This involves an extreme form of massive violation of human rights and in particular, the right of ethnic groups to respect for their cultural identity, end quote. Hindus have experienced genocide, ethnic cleansing, and ethnocide starting from the time of Islamic invasions, starting in 711 current era and spreading all over India through the Mopla and the Razakar massacres of the early to mid 1940s and to the 1990s when Kashmiri Hindus were forced out of their lands and in the 2000s when Hindu pilgrims were burnt in a train and with widespread targeted murders female abduction and conversions happening to the present day. That every Muslim despot from the time of Bin Qasim conducted genocide and ethnocide is a well-documented, horrific episode of Indian history. What is less known is the ethnocide practiced by the colonial invaders. The destruction of India's culture, religions and identity by the British colonial powers counts among the worst egregious violations of basic human rights. Pursuant to the destructive white man's burden policies, the British orchestrated the ethnocide of Indians mainly through these five mechanisms. One, creation of widespread poverty. In my previous upward video, I outlined how war, chicanery, and bigoted policies such as doctrine of lapse helped the British to usurp land all over India and how they brought about economic ruin with policies of high taxation, the refusal to develop Indian industrial infrastructure, unfair trade practices that caused collapse of artisan classes, and the attendant chain reactions through society that caused widespread poverty and the deracination in the country. India copes with the economic repercussions of the British loot even today. Second, destruction of identity via manufactured caste. The alien notion of caste was forced upon the Indic Jati Varna system. I am holding the British responsible for imposing on the social fabric of India through their policies what scholars have called the colonial conception of caste replacing its inherent mobility and fluidity with a rigid hierarchical description frozen in time. This hierarchy is paradoxically further solidified through affirmative action policies of modern India and the accompanying media narrative. Indians have been thought to disown their own caste identity in an attempt to show themselves as progressive. Ironically, it was this identity that helped them survive centuries of persecution. Third, destruction of identity via distorted history. The British came to India before Darwin was born and virtually from the moment they set foot in India, they tried to force fit the chronology of Indian kings to their biblical creation beliefs that the world was created in 4004 BCE. Later in the 1800s, they were obsessed with the desire to find the original Aryan homeland and invented the racist Aryan invasion theory which fuels separatist notions of Tamil Nadu's Dravidian politics even today, which in the 60s led to a silent exodus of Brahmins from the state. Fourth, the destruction of religion via missionary activity. The project of Christianizing India through schools, colleges and hospitals began in 1813 with the renewal of the charter of the East India Company. However, the missionary labor bore fruit only in independent India when entire tribes were lured into Christianity in exchange of material benefits 
and the demographics in certain states in the Northeast and Southern India began to see a catastrophic shift towards Christianity. It is hardly surprising that the same states eventually saw the dominance of separatist politics and five, destruction of education systems via introduction of English. The British engineered the distancing of Indians from their ancient educational systems by alienating Indians from their own heritage with English education, placing them in awe of the Western world by a process of deep mind colonization. The British brought about the English Education Act in 1835, the end result of which was a suffocation of Sanskrit and the rise of a class of elites who looked down upon the classical languages of India. The distancing from Sanskrit meant a pervasive break from the past, where Indians could no longer connect to their roots. The moral posturing of the media and the messaging in pop culture that urges to look forward instead of backward may sound very logical and sincere, but they hide the historical forces that continue to perpetuate ethnocide on India's majority religion through the extensions of the colonial projects in modern India. While Hindus may not be considered to be victims just because they happen to be in majority in India, it is only when we look at them as a global minority that things become clearer. As a free people, it is time we end this ethnocide once and for all. This is Raj Vedan for Upward.